let's get going. I will share my screen. Okay, I will not share my screen. I will share my screen. Let's see. This is just going to take me two seconds because I have multiple screens so that I can still see your faces and the chat box. Okay, lovely. Okay, now your faces are here. When I look this way, you get my best side and my PowerPoints are here and in front of me. Okay, welcome from the Philippines as well and Kosovo. Wow, how wonderful. What a wonderful global group we have today. And I'm so um, glad that you're here. I would love to hear um, as well, if you could rate yourself out of 10, on your knowledge of AIRS uh, conceptualization of sensory integration therapy, how would you rate yourself out of 10? 10 being, I could teach this webinar, and a one being, um, I, this is one of the first times I've heard about it. So if you could pop that in the chat box and just let me know, great, that's really helpful. Oh, we've got some nines and eights. Got a real mix and five, six, twos. Okay. Very helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, let's see what you think at the end. If you actually, <laughs> if you, if I surprise you. Okay. Well, my name's Virginia Spielman. I'm the executive director of Star Institute for Sensory Processing. I am a British trained occupational therapist. My pronouns are she, her. I moved over to America five years ago from Hong Kong, where I was running a private practice interdisciplinary children's therapy clinic. And I came here because I wanted to be part of what I think is happening that is a paradigm shift in how we approach human development, in that it is um, time and that research is supporting the fact that any work with humans and in human development and education should be relationship based, should be respectful, should honor the individual, um, and should be about helping people uh, flourish rather than, rather than survive, that they would thrive. That's why I came over to Star Institute, where we do treatment, research, and education. The idea is that Star Institute um, really, uh, we pioneer um, current best practice in a sensory informed therapy, we utilize as sensory integration, and we are a nonprofit. And so we can't operate without your support. We're a 501c3 registered nonprofit. And it's only through our community and through people like you that we can do the work that we do. So if you would like to even consider a small donation of $5, this is a QR code. Um, it would be so it would mean so much to us. Um, and it really helps us reach more people. This year, for example, we started accepting Medicaid and we're figuring out how to deliver air sensory integration and the star frame of reference, which includes educating parents through Medicaid and other insurance providers at the moment. But today we're here to talk about sensory integration therapy done right. And that is um, what that title should be on this slide. I didn't catch that. Um, but the bullet points have been updated. We're really looking at um, se as sensory integration therapy, as I keep saying, or sensory integration therapy as conceptualized by Ayers. Um, Dr. A. Jean Ayers um, really established sensory integration as an area of human development that needs considerable attention and deserves considerable attention decades ago, um, really starting sort of to, to think about this in the in the mid to late 50s and 60s and and publishing prolifically through the 70s and so on. 
um, many of her mentees are working in the field, really trying to still push the excellence that she challenged us all to bring. Um, and Dr. Lucy Jane Miller was one of those people. And she is the founder of Star Institute for Sensory Processing and um, our director emeritus. She has retired now, um, but is still very much a force to be reckoned with. And so we just want to acknowledge her as well. We're gonna talk about all of this. We're gonna talk about the difference between sensory integration therapy and sensory informed approaches. One of the things that we find more and more nowadays is that um, many people are saying that they are providing sensory integration therapy and or even training others in sensory integration therapy. And really what they mean is that they are using a sensory informed approach, which is very different. And we'll talk about why. If you have questions as we go, please drop them in the chat. I do have people on that will help capture the most important questions if I miss them. We're gonna talk very quickly about what integration means from a brain point of view. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how this isn't graded exposure, um, but that's more um, relevant for the next, um, the next presentation, which is, I need to get that date, which is in a couple of months, I think. Okay, so sensory integration, um, what it really is, uh, what child-led really means, because again, that's something that has been um, used in many, many different ways and is almost becoming a bit of an inflammatory term. Um, we're gonna talk about the importance of consent in sensory integration therapy. And when you have fidelity to sensory integration therapy, which means you are delivering the model as it was designed to be delivered, you have fidelity to the model, um, the fact that consent and char the child-led piece are non-negotiable. And also the fact that emotions will come up when you're doing this work. And that's always been recognized from the very beginnings of the development of this approach. This is Dr. Ayres, um, and you're gonna hear many quotes from her because I believe her voice is incredibly important. And when we're talking about what sensory integration therapy done right looks like, going back to the sort of original source um, material is very, very helpful and important. So let's look at this quote. If a child cannot explore his own potential and it is difficult for him to do so alone, the therapist must intervene. And intervene in this situation means aiding, assisting, modifying and suggesting, bringing out of the child that which he cannot quite bring out by himself. And so really what we're doing is we are scaffolding and facilitating and inviting the child to move into these areas um, that help them explore their own potential on their own terms. I wonder if sometimes the term intervention um, confuses us and makes us think that it becomes our own agenda instead of the child's. And I don't believe that that's the case or was the case in the original source material. So let's talk about the goal of sensory integration therapy. The goal of sensory integration therapy uh, that's often talked about is helping the child um, achieve an adaptive response. And so what we mean by that is um, an event occurs and they are able to respond to it the way that they want to and in a way that is healthy and safe and therefore adaptive, supports their ability to regulate. So we're looking for the adaptive response. What we're looking for is that when there is something in the environment, a cause, that the child, that the effect that, that, that it elicits from the child is purposeful and um, self-actualizing. It's what the child wants to do. We're also looking at what we call occupational roles. Sensory integration therapy is an um, approach that started and is deeply embedded in occupational therapy principles and philosophy. Um, and so what we've got is um, this participation in occupational roles as a key focus of sensory integration. Um, and so what we're thinking about 
in the early years of life, how the childhood occupations are attachment occupations, as in learning to enjoy other people and to connect with other people, no matter what that looks like for your neurotype. Uh, development of effective emotion regulation is also one of those jobs of the first few months of life. Then there's fine motor and gross motor skill development, social skills, play skills, all those more traditional occupations that are more mainstream and discussed uh, at great length all the time by everybody. You will get a PDF of this PowerPoint emailed to you um, after the um, presentation. Planning and sequencing novel tasks. Um, so mean we, what we mean by that is responding to novelty and and think about that first year of life really that's all you're doing everything's novel. You know, those of you that hang out with children, do you remember the first time the child sees a pond full of ducks the first time the child sees the beach the first time the, the child sees you know, a holiday celebration or the first three times a child sees a holiday celebration with the colors and the lights and the joy and the dancing. Responding to novelty is one of the jobs of childhood. It is a childhood occupation. Okay. And so as we mature and, and through the lifespan and continue to engage in occupational roles that we value, it, involves care of self and care of others uh, and engagement with people and objects and participation in social contexts but again on that person's own terms that's a very important part of occupational therapy that it's not imposed but it's rather facilitated and scaffolded and that people are able to discover their authentic selves and realize the occupations that are important to them so already you can see that there are these lovely values and philosophies in occupational therapy and in sensory integration therapy that can be very easily distorted or watered down when um, we put sensory integration therapy in different contexts that have conflicting beliefs. And so you could think about the education system I feel like there's sort of two sets of beliefs there. There's the very altruistic beliefs of the education system that um, we are raising up adults who would care for one another and contribute to their community and so on. And then there's sort of the real life presentation of our education system across the world, which is about managing children as easily as possible, making things um, work when you have very high adult to child ratios, 30 to one and so on, and getting children through school to pass exams, which is a very different approach to education and slightly in conflict with these goals of helping our children realize their authentic selves, that, that who they want to be in the world and that they contribute to the world because they get it, because they enjoy it, and because they feel that they belong in the world, rather than through duty or to um, gain, uh, you know, or to get a reward. So we're talking about function and participation. Um, we're talking about the person being able to engage in behaviors that will help them achieve their own goals. We're talking about um, being able to be regulated in the right way at the right time. And we'll talk a little bit more about what regulation means. But when we talk about regulation, we're really talking about our nervous system state. Am I calm and alert enough to be able to be here fully focused on you, but also aware of my environment enough that I will notice uh, something urgent that needs responding to. And that's sort of a body-based and lower brain-based function um, regulation. It's not something we can really change by choice, um, although that's an oversimplification. And then you've got self-management, self-organization, um, and executive function, which rely on this regulation, this state arousal of our nervous system. 
Um, we want our, our clients, we want humans to enjoy other people, to be able to build relationships that are healthy and nourishing. Um, for them to flourish and achieve psychological well-being. Ultimately, we want children who feel safe in the world and are active social agents, and I'll say again, on their own terms, that they can achieve grit and resilience and shared social problem solving, that they can be flexible on their own terms, not because they've been told to and not because they want um, to check some boxes or get some arbitrary reward. We want that self-organization that comes from inside the child. We want this child to be able to be who they want to be autonomously themselves and to participate in the way they want to participate and in ways that are meaningful for them. And as they do that, to discover who they are and to grow and change and, you know, make sense of their personal stories, the good and the bad. And we want for everyone that sense of connectedness, communality, and relatedness. These are really the goals of sensory integration therapy, not handwriting, not engaging in non-preferred activities, not sitting at a table for a sustained amount of time. Do you see the difference as I suddenly bring in those kinds of goals from talking about the core values of SI and occupational therapy. Another part of sensory integration is really understanding play as an occupation. And there are many therapists, occupational therapists, who've done amazing work on this. But let's just think about all the things that play helps us um, explore and uh, develop and realize as we go through the world. Um, Play allows us to figure out what happened today. It allows us to master our fine and gross motor skills. It allows to explore emotions. It allows us to have alone time. It allows us to be connected. One of my favorite ways of playing um, is sitting alongside someone doing crafts, not necessarily really even talking, but in parallel feeling that sense of belonging and peace and connection. So play doesn't really have a look. It can also be pretend play. And I still do that as an adult with role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, play involves leisure. Play involves sorting. Some of you parents out there, when you put away toys, your children's toys, sorting the toys into different colors and boxes is one of the, your favorite pastimes. And that can be play too, taxonomies and systemization exploring the environment play uh, for some adults is going to uh, a car show and looking at the cars all lined up in a beautiful row and looking at the different types of cars and enjoying the the wild paint on the cars and the hubcaps and looking under the hood there's so many ways that plays presents itself there's no right way to play and that's a very critical part of sensory integration therapy done right as well is that you wouldn't you wouldn't bring in unless there's a safety issue um, uh, correction around what play looks like and that means that neurodivergent play then is acceptable play and again, this is one of the areas where the core values of occupational therapy and sensory integration therapy can be easily influenced by the environment in which they're taking place. And so if we're in an environment that's very ableist and thinks that there is one right way to play and one right way to be a human, then we might find ourselves trying to beginning to start feeling uncomfortable with different forms of neurodivergent play. But when we're doing sensory integration therapy the right way, I truly believe that we would honor and respect everyone's play preferences and be comfortable with saying we're joining and scaffolding here, this is what the child loves, this is what they enjoy, and it's beautiful. And one of the pieces of that is being able to join the play um, at the right pace for the child, at the respectful distance or proximity. Maybe they need you really close. Maybe they need you a bit further away. Um, and authentically finding something truly enjoyable about the play so that you can express that um, 
celebration and pleasure in the child's play ideas and that they start believing that they are brilliant and that they have good ideas and that communication with adults is worthwhile. Um, and, you know, so we're thinking about all these different things that we want for our children and what we have to do, I think, as a regular checkup as a sensory integration therapist is come back and peel away some of that, um, some of the layers that are placed on us by um, by the systems that we that we exist within. Um, so, you know, thinking about um, thinking about wanting our handwriting above all else, uh, you know, wanting our children to be academic before they've really been in their bodies. The academia will come, right? And we need to just every now and then like have this fine tuning of our therapeutic goals and our mission and our vision as sensory integration therapists and come back to helping the child achieve bodily sense of self and mastery of their body. I would love that if we had different education systems, you know, for the different speed and pace that our children's different bodies need. But what seems to have happened at the moment is more of a factory line of education and children are showing up early and earlier being asked to sit still and listen, which is really something that comes online much later in life, both of those things at once. And in fact, I would challenge you to even think if it's appropriate in adulthood. Um, so there are those different pieces. What are our children learning? Well, what we really want them to learn um, is self-organization. That I can be who I want to be in space because I want to. And that my motivation is, it's safe to um, express what I want to do and I can achieve what I want to do. Um, sensory integration theory emerged because of Ayer's constant imperative to look beyond behavior and gain understanding. And this, uh, that quote comes from the first chapter of the New Bundy and Lane um, that um, has a beautiful chapter on the history of Ayer's sensory integration. And I do encourage everyone to take a look at it. And it's here. I will just show you. There you go. So there's a lovely first chapter in here, and you can see it's one of my favorite books, um, just about the history, and it's well worth a look. You know, they talk about who Ayers was, not a social, social person, but very relational, amazingly kind and an excellent listener. Um, and so what we're really talking with self-organization is also this sense of agency. The experience of controlling my action to influence events in the environment and the example I always use and I apologize if you've heard this before is a child sitting in their high chair and they drop the cup off the high chair right you've you've seen that video or you've met that child at that stage and the first time it happens you pick it up and you look at the child like okay here it is and then the second time it happens you go, oh, okay, we're playing this game and you maybe even giggle. And then the 99th time it happens, you put the cup back on the tray and you sort of say, could we be done now, right? Um, but that child has just moved objects in the world and elicited a response from you 99 times that shows them that their, that their self-organization and their mastery of movement and manipulation of objects influences events in the world, changes other people's behavior through their own goal-directed behavior. And they start to realize that they are an agent in the world and they start to become then this self. So there's this piece of I move, therefore I am, that's very, very important. And it really is related to this concept of the self-organized child. Very critical, critical concept. Um, so let's talk about um, the idea that essentially sensory integration is critical for human development. It can support 
function and it should support function. But for some of our children, family members, even some of us in this webinar, our sensory integration capacity, those systems can actually be disruptive at times. And we need very specifically designed environments and activities to help us achieve organization so that we can be that agent who has mastery in the world. The so sensory integration is pivotal to human development and inseparable from emotion and relationships. It's how we understand emotion, it's how we feel emotion, and it's how we build a relationships through socio-sensory signaling between you and the other person. Think about it, you see things, you feel touch, um, you associate taste and smell, um, you move together, you rock the baby, you hold the baby tight, you hold your loved one tight, and so on and so on. Okay, the slide is not moving on. There we go. And so what we're, what we're doing, and this is an important point with this work, is with, we are creating experiences that optimize or make the most of our brain and body's neuroplasticity. So there is a, a, a focus on brain change, but I want you to know that it's really, it's brain growth is a better way of putting it. When you learn a new telephone number, you are changing your brain. Um, when you learn a new route, a, a new way to drive, there is brain change. When you learn to play an instrument, um, there is brain change. And so when we talk about supporting brain change, we're really talking about brain development or brain growth that enables mastery of the body. We're not talking about trying to make everybody's brain look one way. I don't believe um, that that's ever been the intention of sensory integration therapy. And if you look at, if you go back to some of the source material and read the blue book, Sensory Integration and Learning Disorders, especially the last chapter, you will see that we're talking about um, supporting brain and nervous system growth that enables the person to be who they want to be in the world it's on their terms um, and it's not about making nice little robotic children that all look the same um, when a child with differences in sensory integration is only supported by systems that were created for the neuro majority or one neurotype um, they don't experience organizing repetitive activities. When the neurodivergent brain is only supported in, in ways that are designed for another type of brain, the repetitive experiences that they are exposed to are in fact disorganizing, dysregulating, and therefore do not support brain development that facilitates self-actualization, that enables mastery. I hope that makes sense. So if I am a child who experiences light touch as uncomfortable and perhaps even painful, but no one comes in and explains that to my caregivers, my, um, my nanny or my, my daycare, my, my um, education, um, my education team, then I'm going to continuously be experiencing light touch that activates my self protective systems, my fight or flight systems. And that is going to create um, maladaptive responses. Now, what we mean by that is a response that is designed to keep me alive in the moment, but actually doesn't really serve the purpose of helping me flourish in all other areas. But because I'm again and again and again and again experiencing this light touch and constantly having my brain and body say, oh my goodness, this is a threat, this is a threat, or this is even painful, which I have met a few 
people who experience light touch as painful, um, then we, the brain change that will occur is going to be disorganized or it's going to be um, confounding to the mastery of my body. So we create this negative cycle. We have a child with differences in sensory integration being met by a rigid world that will not accommodate them, that is not noticing and is not providing the learning experiences that they need, the nurturing experiences that they need. This creates a negative cycle. My differences in sensory integration are met by a rigid world that does not nourish me, but makes me feel unsafe. My differences in sensory integration, therefore, only um, grow. They only get bigger. They only become more problematic. And that's where this idea of disordered sensory integration and processing has really come from. Disordered really only meaning in the wrong order and not supporting function. So what we're doing when we come in with um, this sensory integration therapy and we're looking at neuroplasticity and brain growth, brain development, is we're saying for this brain and body, what is going to be organizing? What is going to help this child realize that they're brilliant? What is going to help them engage with the world on their own terms because they want to? So very, very different way of looking at things. And again, like we need to keep coming back to these core pieces, these philosophical pieces, so that um, we resist being socialized into the ableist model um, or the normalization model of human development. And we're gonna talk about that more in our other webinars as well. So that child-centered piece of the self-organized child, the self-actualizing child is central and pivotal to all sensory integration therapy. And it's there from the very, very beginning. One of the beautiful things about the way air sensory integration was established was that it involved something we call attunement. And that is this ability to deeply read the cues of the child, to, to connect with them at a very whole um, body, emotion, energy level, to authentically join that child and to be attuned to the signals that they're sending and be able to provide the play activities that they need so that they leave the session an inch taller than they were when they came in because they can't they just achieved so much and it was all stuff that they wanted to do do you see that they wanted to do so critical and so we need to keep coming back to this so that we can resist that socialization, as I said, into behavioral normalization and ableist sort of systems. And we can say, well, we're doing it this way and we're confidently doing it this way because. Um, and so that child-led piece is central. Now I'm gonna take you on a very quick tour of AIRS sensory integration fidelity measure. So this is the measure that was designed um, for people to establish whether or not they were truly um, applying the model to their work. And this also helps with research. So when you read research on air sensory integration or sensory integration therapy, if it does not report that it met the criteria for fidelity, it is not, um, uh, it does not have external val validity. It is not research that is actually helpful and actually talking about what it says it's talking about. And that is a sadly a large uh, proportion of uh, the research that's been produced. So l always look for that fidelity measure. But it's also how you can tell whether your child is receiving as sensory integration therapy, whether you as a therapist are delivering as sensory integration therapy, and so on. A manager, you can check this with your clients and so on. Okay, so there are structural elements first. Very, very straightforward. One of them is that the, the, um, the therapist needs to have had 
post-professional training in SI. They need a minimum of 50 education hours in SI theory and practice to really understand what they're doing from that neurological perspective, with the strategies that they're using, how to be child-led, how to be safe, and so on. So if you've got people traveling around or, or inviting you to come to their trainings and it's just a weekend, as a therapist, I want you to just be careful and realize that you will not come out of that um, as a fully fledged sensory integration therapist. You might have a piece or you might not if they don't have fidelity to the model. So there are particular certifications that are more widely recognized. Um, the CLASI group, Classy, do a certification that's, that's uh, uh, got fidelity to the model, and they're the home of many of these pieces. Um, USC um, does a certification program that is this that meets these requirements is very high quality. The SI network and in the UK and ASI Wise, I believe it's called in the UK, and um, the Star Institute. Um, we provide certification um, that it but that has a slightly different emphasis in that we really emphasize relationships and regulation. We'd really love people to do both. Um, and another group, if I didn't say, is the Spiral Foundation have a wonderful certification program as well. So all of these different places, none of them are just two days or an evening, okay? And there's, there's so much work that's involved. Um, and it does sort of create a bit of a glass ceiling for new graduates. Um, I see that question in the chat, but um, what you want to do is um, get as much training as you can and then apply for a position in a clinic that has fidelity to the model and will support you with finishing your certification. Okay, so the OT assessment report also needs to have fidelity to the model, and this is kind of a, an eye opening one for some people who would rather not write reports or issue very minimal reports, but the OT report should contain all of these pieces. Um, and look at all those different com components at the star Institute, we also ensure that our um, reports are strength based. Um, and that we try and we, and we decipher them for our parents as well. They should be understandable. Okay, more structural elements. Um, the physical environment for air sensory integration. Now, let me just pause and say um, when Dr. Jean Ayres was uh, first pioneering this model, um, that uh, many, all the equipment was. Uh, made by, um, as I believe majority of it was actually made by her husband, but it was made, not bought. And then as people started manufacturing this stuff, there was there were more and more purchases. So the physical environment for air sensory integration has these requirements. They do not all have to cost, you know, five figures. Um, there are ways to do it um, across the world in different contexts, in different socioeconomic situations. But we need adequate space. Um, for flow of vigorous physical activity, and it needs to be safe space, it needs to be flexible space that you can change the configuration of, that there could be rapid change in the middle of intervention. That's another hard one for therapists. Some therapists really don't want that extra praxis of changing the environment, and they'd rather everything stayed the same all the time, and that we approach the equipment in the same order all the time. That's not as sensory integration. Uh, one or more rotational device, a quiet space for calming down, um, one or more sets of bungee cords so that we get up and down movement, um, you know, scooter boards, cushions, pillows, ramps, all these different things, and then documentation of routine monitoring of equipment safety is another important piece. Then there's communication with parents and teachers. That's in the fidelity measure, that the goal setting is uh, collaborative and informed by the child and the family, um, and that there is family or and or teacher education that is an ongoing interchange to direct the course of intervention. Discussing the potential influence of sensory integration and praxis on performance and so on. So really trying to level up 
our communities and our whole teams to understand how sensory health, how the sensory integration domain, that part of human function is so foundational to everything and really needs to be understood and considered in depth. Um, and so that could be for your school OTs, whole school level work that you're doing um, and makes a huge difference. And then we've got our process elements, okay? So we've, we've done the structural elements and then we've got our process elements. The process elements include presenting sensory opportunities. That is very different to imposing sensory experiences. Air sensory integration does not believe that imposed experiences are beneficial. When the child self-organizes and responds to an invitation to participate in a sensory opportunity, the theory is that neurologically, there's much more integration and a much more organized experience. If sensory experiences are imposed on a body and brain that is not ready to engage with that sensory experience or finds it even worse, aversive and upsetting and disorganizing, then what's happening? Not the development of the self-organized child, but more disorganized experiences, more experiences that undermine their growing sense of self and more experiences that tell them not to listen to the wisdom of their body and that their body is unreliable. And if you think back to this idea of bodily sense of self kind of being a foundation for later parts of development, if we undermine bodily of sense of self, we're really creating and perpetuating trauma. So we're presenting sensory opportunities, not, as I said, imposing them. And there really should be more than two. So this is interesting as well, because there are so many sensory spaces and sensory groups that really just mean messy play, messy play spaces and messy groups. But um, we're talking about touch, yes, we're talking about movement. We're talking about the position sense, that proprioceptive sense that's in your joints and your muscle spindles that tells you how much force you need to use or how much um, traction uh, when you hang from something. Um, and so on. And that vestibular sense, you know, that sense of where my head is in relation to gravity, as well as the other sensory systems. And then there's this idea of physical safety, um, which I believe implicitly also implies emotional safety. We, we kind of call that out in the star frame of reference, that there has to be perceived um, emotional safety as well. When we talk about ensuring physical safety, it's not just that we can check the box and say, um, yeah, I've done everything. It's also about the, the child and the family feeling that sense of safety. If the child doesn't feel safe, let's, let's think about those of you that do SI therapy, gravitational insecurity. So this is when a child cannot take their feet off the ground without all of their alarm bells ringing um and they um and it's just yeah puts them into this emergency state the state of vigilance and possibly even fight or flight um just because your environment is safe does not mean you pick them up and place them on the swing and start pushing them and telling them that they're safe and they need to just deal with it they also have to feel that sense of safety because again that is the only way to support development of the self-organized child. If they feel unsafe, this experience that they're having is going to code in their brain as unpleasant and aversive. It's also gonna undermine their sense of self and then they're gonna be so dysregulated that no learning growth development is going to occur. Um, okay. We're also looking for uh, therapists that help the child attain and maintain appropriate levels of alertness. So there's that self-regulation piece um, that I've been talking about all the way through. And really what we want to see our therapists doing is always coming back to self-regulation. I did a session yesterday. Um, my young friend walked in. We have the best time um, together, but the gym was very, very noisy. And immediately I saw um, their state of regulation kind of flip. 
and it went too high and they went into fight mode, which is one of their sort of default settings, unfortunately, because of some previous um, uh, mismatches in the support they got. And um, so we spent the whole session just working on recovery, repair, feeling the wisdom of our body, acknowledging the wisdom of their body and helping them come back to this appropriate level of alertness for them, not for me, not for my agenda, not for what I want them to achieve, but for them to feel safe in the world and that they can be self-organized. And it was really a very, very beautiful session. And at the end, they said to me and to mom um, that they loved us and that they felt better now. And, you know, I wish I had recorded it because it couldn't have been clearer that that was what they needed. There's also this piece of looking at posture um, eye movements, the mouth, and the coordination of the two sides of the bodies. And so often what we see in people who are doing what they call sensory integration therapy is that they only focus on modulation. And what we mean by modulation is that I can respond to a sensory event in the environment or in my body to the appropriate degree. If the phone rings, I might sort of jump at first but then I'll be able to realize that it's just the phone and it's not alarming. If I have difficulties with modulation, when the phone rings, it doesn't matter what I think in my upstairs brain, my body-based processing at the nerve level, at the synaptic level where the nerves are connecting with each other is um, processing that data as more intense, more uh, loud, more vibrant, um, and I therefore am constantly orienting to things in my environment and scanning for threats. Um, that's what we mean by over responsivity in many, many situations. Under responsivity is the other side of the coin where I need more and more and more and more data. I need a phone that rings and flashes and vibrates before I'm going to orient to it in my environment. And again, that's not about me like being able to just have a word with myself. It's not about my upstairs brain. It's a body-based, lower brain-based process here when we talk about sensory modulation. Very, very important to understand this, but not the whole picture. We also need therapists who can really understand posture, which is an incredibly complex dynamic system that supports function and and is connected to eye movements we also want oral motor understanding and that huge thing called bilateral motor coordination the coordination of the two sides of my body um, and motor planning so just just pausing for a second from the fidelity measure and sort of reflecting on how we're coming back to the core philosophy of air sensory integration therapy what layers do you need to peel away so that we can be supporting the development of this person this human this this wonderful being um, and helping them experience that sense of i move therefore i am and it's all in here, it's all in the model. So we've got this praxis piece that I just referred to where the therapist is presenting challenges to the child that um, we talk about the just right challenge, right? So if you're in education or you've read Vygotsky, um, you understand the zone of proximal development, I hope, which is um, these are these are my skills and right here at the edge is where I'm ready to grow in my capacity and my mastery of myself in the world. Um, and that's what uh, we're, when we're talking about sensory integration and processing, when we're talking about sensory motor development, we call this the, the just right challenge. It's very, very similar. Um, Dr. Lucy Miller calls it the just right success, which is really helpful to think about that what if it if, if the child can't be successful in that space, then you've gone too far that's on you, and you need to bring it back in and figure out where that success is. But it's success that is enabling growth enable enabling mastery enabling self actualization. 
It's also collaborative. And that means that the therapist is not sitting down watching. It means that they're not providing a list and being um, a dictator about what the session is gonna look like. It also means they're not providing controlled choices, right? I'm just gonna give you two options. That's not collaborative. Collaborative is really very, very open-ended. Um, and if the child just wants to sit on a, on a beanbag that day, you you kind of you've got to collaborate with that child and you can't as soon as you enter into a power struggle as soon as there's signs of coercion you've moved away from collaboration and so we have to obviously this is not the same as permissiveness we have to keep the child safe and so those are non-negotiables there are grown-up caregiver non-negotiables around safety around being kind to other people around self-harm and around toileting, for example. And then there's collaboration in the activity, which is much more open ended, which does mean that there is an element of therapeutic chaos that we welcome into our air sensory integration sessions. And when a parent says to us, did I really just pay for you to play with my child for an hour, we can say, did it look like play? Excellent. That means I'm doing my job let me tell you everything that just happened and that what my clinical reasoning was it's always collaborative it's a partnership and it's not a power struggle and this is you know where we sort of come in again to this development of self of the child that this child is dropping the cup off the high chair and causing behavioral change in their play partner who picks it up again and again and again with less excitement each time that they pick it up. All of that is rich information for learning about the world, for making meaning about myself, about my relationships, about how loved I am, about who I want to be. We are meaning makers. And this meaning making is sensory and emotional all the time. So think about the child who is unable to grasp the cup, extend their arm and drop it off the high chair tray. They have an intention that they cannot execute and they are therefore thwarted in their mastery of self and their meaning making. What we are responsible for as the adults around that child is helping them get the input, the organizing, repetitive, joyful child-led input that helps them drop the cop off the high chair tray. And that might mean that in sensory integration sessions, we are repeating something 100, 200, 300 times because there's a kind of um, therapeutic replacement of an activity that they were not able to realize when they were younger. And so play is really important and looking like play um, that, that it looks like play is really important. Um, and so we've got this, uh, this, the importance of generating meaning, which, which, you know, when we're not providing attuned and um, carefully thought through scaffolded um, invitations to play and activity for our children really means we're, we're thwarting their ability to generate this, um, uh, sense of meaning, right? And that it's called a psychic catastrophe. But when, when we do sensory integration therapy, right, we're supporting this um, person making coherent and complex meaning of their sense of self in the world. Um, okay, so we're nearly through the fidelity measure, bear with me. Right, we've got um, as well this idea of the just right challenge that I talked about, this increasing complexity, um, this attunement to the child. And again, you can see there, success, 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 right? Um, and there's posture, there's ocular, there's not just sensory modulation. When, you know, I, I think so often when people haven't completed the full training and unfortunately probably sometimes even when they have we <clears throat> we find that people think things are sensory over responsivity because the child gets dysregulated when in fact they might be praxis or they might be posture 
which would equally, of course, uh, contribute to dysregulation. I have an idea and I can't execute it. I'm going to get dysregulated. I can feel someone touching me on my body, but I can't tell where it is, that discrimination part. That would cause me to be dysregulated when I'm touched. And I might respond to every single touch input as if it's a catastrophe because I don't know where to file it. It's not that actually I have a modulation issue. That's not happening at that synaptic level. That discrimination challenge is happening higher up. And really what I, my brain is able to process is you've been touched. We don't know if you're safe or not because we don't know where you were touched or how hard you were touched, what type of shape touched you, how fast you were touched, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. Come on, there we go. Um, and then again, so we're, we're sort of tapping in. Can you see this emphasis where it's almost repetitive? This emphasis on the self-organization of the child, this emphasis on providing opportunities for growth and mastery. Um, and so supporting the child's intrinsic motivation to play. Again, if you move towards coercion or a power struggle, you've lost this. And that's on you. You have to come back. You have to readjust. And that's why reflective practice, in my opinion, is uh, absolute non-negotiable of, um, of being a sensory integration therapist. Um, so we are creating these invitations. We're using ourselves and the environment to support the play of the child in a way that lets them feel like they can safely tap into their internal motivation, take risks and figure out who they want to be in the world. Um, and so there's trust, there's attunement, there's relationship, there's mutually enjoyable partnership. If you're doing sensory integration therapy, right. So there's a great quote here that I just want to look at um, from Diane Parham, who's a wonderful uh, clinician and theorist and researcher and teacher. Um, and this is from, from some time ago, but it's absolutely relevant right now. Let us juxtapose behavior modification with sensory integrative treatment methods. Behavior modification typically centers on the systematic administration of rewards and punishments by agents outside the child, such as parents or therapists. Implicit in this treatment is a valuing of controls on behavior that are external to the child. Sensory integration, conversely, focuses on the degree to which the child can organize his or her own behavior. The role of the therapist is to organize the environment to maximize the likelihood of success and increasing complexity in child directed activities. Thus, there is an implicit valuing of internal within child controls on behavior. The child is the master of themselves. The adult is not the master of the child. So, we come back to Ayer's words and the kind of involvement necessary to achieve um, this self-directed child. It's about, again, here, look at this, no power struggles, no commanding, no control, but eliciting, inviting, facilitating, and scaffolding um, playfully. It must be playful. It must be relationship-based. That child must authentically feel that you celebrate them as an occupational being, um, that you honor their spirit. And that means you cannot send subliminal messages that what they are doing is aberrant, is deviant from the norm, is unusual, that we actually really am, are comfortable with diversity and divergent brains and bodies that we can enjoy the company of other children we spend time with. And when you stop enjoying the company of the child you're spending time with, that's when you really need that reflective practice and, and maybe to think about um, getting someone else involved in the therapeutic process. Um, so this unique child in this space at this time and all the wonderful things they have to offer need to be authentically celebrated by the therapist in order for you to be truly delivering sensory integration therapy. These are not even my words. This is Suzanne smith Rolly and um, Suzanne Spitzer. And it's a, you know, just beautifully summarized bullet points. And then you're also constantly 
tuning into gestural communication, affective communication, and the nervous system is the is is this child? I used to have a child that I saw um, many years ago whose eyebrows would go red when she was getting into that state of dysregulation where she wasn't going to be okay anymore. And uh, that was the only way we could actually tell for a really long time. So we'd have to check in with her eyebrows because the skin underneath would get flushed. Um, and so we're looking at the nervous system. We're looking at the affective gestural communication, that attunement piece that is our job, that is our labor. Um, and that's a really important um, part of the work that is supported by current evidence coming out of um, autism research that is led by autistic researchers, which is beautiful. And so this is lovely thing called the double empathy problem that I would encourage you to go and look up at Frontiers. Um, just Google double empathy problem online and you'll get so many resources. But this idea that historically, what has become baked in to the way we support neurodivergent brains and bodies is that they have to do the work to look more like the neuromajority. Think about whole body listening in the classroom, right? If you've ever observed a kindergarten age type classroom, there isn't a child in there that's doing whole body listening, but the neurodivergent children, the children, uh, the autistic children, the children with an ADHD diagnosis, uh, the children with trauma and behavioral diagnoses, they're expected to do whole body listening. And suddenly they're being asked to do more than their peers in that space and it's even harder for them because of the resources it takes because they haven't had the supportive bod whole body brain work and opportunities that are organizing for them in order to develop and self-actualize and grow so the labor is on the adults Right. And then when we're talking about peer to peer interactions, the labor is divided. It's not all on the neurodivergent child. So um, what do we have to do? Like, what do you, what do you have to do as a therapist or an educator who wants to be sensory informed in your work? You need to work on those attunement skills. Can you pick up neurodivergent social cues? Disordered or different sensory integration and processing is a neurodivergence. It's also very, very common um, in autism. There's almost no autistic people that don't have some sensory differences um, in ADHD and, and, and in um, children who've been adopted and been in foster care, uh, children with mental health differences and so on. Um, we have to work on all of these pieces. So can you pick up those different social cues or do you miss them? And a, and a way to, to really work on that is through videoing your sessions with permission and then looking back on them with by yourself or with a mentor. Um, are you able to read that body language and those gestures? Are you able to see that tone of voice, um, facial expressions? Are you able to understand the use of echolalia, which is not um, what, we used to think it is. For some reason, there was this understanding that echolalia and, and that type of language processing was, was something everyone did. Then it became something to be scared of in our autistic children and to extinguish immediately. And now we're coming back, and, I, and more and more and more, I hope, into realizing that echolalia is often functional and communicative. What's the communicative at, at intent of the child who comes up to you in the classroom and shows you their um, their arms and says, we're not scared. Um, I can't remember the rest of the lyrics, but um, do you, you know the story. I mean, we're going on a bear hunt. We're gonna catch a big one. We're not scared. And they show you their arms. This is obviously based on a real story that I experienced. And you know, the teacher was like, oh, we're not telling that story now. Let's go back and get on task, off task behaviors, right? Uh, um, and actually what this child was saying when you looked at their sleeves was, my sleeves are wet and I feel distressed. And here is a piece of language that expresses some distress that I'm gonna use to help me communicate to you this state that I'm in. Um, and so that's work that we have to do, right? Learning these different forms of communication, understanding forms of protest so that we can always, always, always honor consent 
of the child. And I think I've covered um, hopefully well enough um, why consent is critical, um, not just for sense of safety, not just because we don't want to perpetuate trauma, but because if we also want our children to grow, develop and learn, um, then um, we have to honor consent so that their brain and body are available for learning. Um, and then there's also this sort of more complex question about uh, sometimes getting stuck in a praxis rut or a motor loop and not really wanting to be there and needing help. And that is really something I would probably tell you to park for future uh, professional development times because we will certainly not have time to go into it today. We have very little time left. Okay, so remember, maybe, maybe this is the slide that you print off on one page and um, stick up on your wall. Listening doesn't have a look. And we need to, the, the, the job of attunement is ours. And listening doesn't have a look is a lovely phrase that's come out of the spelling to communicate community, um, which again is something you could look up more. Uh, we always need to give our children a way of communicating with us um, because we want to honor consent because we want to be child led. And so if we can't do that because we can't communicate, then communication is the first stop. Um, presuming competence. Presuming competence actually means more than we've recently uh, presented, I believe. You know, when we talk about presuming competence, I think, you know, for me, historically, it meant, I know this child's a good person. I know that they want, that they can learn and grow. And really, presuming competence means I believe that this person is my equal and my peer, and I'm going to treat them, especially with neurodivergent brains and bodies, in as much of an age appropriate way as I can. I'm going to give them opportunities that honor their chronological age rather than getting stuck on their developmental age. Whoops. Um, really minimizing positive reinforcement and use of rewards never using time out we use time ins where we sit quietly with the child and help them regulate if you put someone in a time out and um they um uh are dysregulated you're asking a dysregulated person to do a lot of work whereas if you can lend them your calm and help them access the co-regulation that you can offer them, then they will learn to recover and repair from stress faster. Um, timeouts really just um, make, like, make those neurons of disorganization fire again and again and again and again. And what, what you're gonna get is myelination or you're gonna get reinforcement of um, dysregulation patterns. So timeouts are not great. Okay, um, so we're going to um, both, oh, sorry, both do the work. Wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, forward earlier and now it's forwarding too fast. Um, we're going to really pay attention to that double empathy piece. We're gonna work on the attunement piece. We are going to really um, be comfortable with different perspectives and lived experiences because diversity benefits everyone it benefits the whole community and we want this sort of the, the unique qualities of the person to be celebrated um and so we are going to work on um these different pieces now this is straight from Ayer's work again and she talked about guided guided exploration so again like child-led guided exploration that's not structured exploration right that's not there isn't a right order to do these th these things and it's safety it's it's uh, collaboration it's oh you want to do that let's do it together um, she also talked about release of hostility and what she meant was kicking and smashing cardboard cartons hitting balloons until they break so that the stress cycle can be closed for that child um, and then introducing a less demanding therapeutic task that carries more assurance of a success. That's what she says in the book. So very, very interesting. And structured permissiveness, right? Which is avoid coercion. Don't get into power struggles, but still have boundaries around safety and kindness and self-care. 
And so we're not only sitting back while the children determine their treatment sort of you know, all over the place, we're involved. We're involved with them physically, we're involved with them emotionally. We are authentically attuned, um, not to the cop at, at the expense of the sensory integration piece, right? We're not turning this into mental health therapy, but we're making space for the emotions that naturally arise. Okay, I'm gonna just skip through these. We're gonna talk about these in the next um, presentation. So when the therapist is doing their job effectively and the child is organizing their nervous system, it looks as if the child is merely playing. And that's that piece where we can say, um, I'm so glad it looked like a therapy session, a play session. Let me tell you exactly what we were doing. Okay, now I have a few minutes for questions and I need someone to um, bump those up for me. Um, Let's see what, there's many that have been answered in the chat and we can download the chat and uh, make that available to people. Um, oh, questions are in a, have been sent to me in a different way. So just give me a second and I'll pull those up, maybe. Yes. Okay, so I'm looking at all your faces again now. It's so nice to see all of you. Those of you that kept the cameras on, I actually, I really appreciate it because and I know I'm not talking to nobody. Okay, so let's see. Questions. Okay. Uh, what is the name of the book I referred to? I um, referred to two books. I referred to Sensory Integration and Learning Disorders by A. G. Ness, which is from the 70s. And you'll probably have to buy, you'll certainly have to buy it on the used book market. And then Sensory Integration Theory and Practice by Bundy and Lane, um, the latest edition. And that edition in, I believe it's chapter one. I'm just going to double check that I'm telling you the truth. Maybe uh, is about, no, there's just too many bookmarks in here. Chapter two, maybe, composing a theory, chapter two, chapter three, composing a theory, a historical perspective, and really talks about the how as sensory integration was uh, established. Um, so um, next question, autonomy, self-agency, self-organizing are central to SI. Um, that's often interpreted to mean independence in the sense that the goal should be that the person does not require support and accommodation, but that is not what SI is about, correct? I, I would agree with that, absolutely. I think it's one of those implicit pieces. Um, sensory integration um, is just as much about interdependence as it is about independence. It's just as much about being able to access the soothing, caring, co-regulating, um, uh, support I'm being offered from my caregivers as it is about being able to self-regulate myself independently. Um, and I think that's something that we've lost in recent decades as we've sort of become much more of an individualistic society. I, I believe that communality and connection was really built into the origins of sensory integration therapy. And again, it's something we really need to resist losing as we do the work that we're doing. Um, I have looked at theory of mind. That is a whole nother question, but essentially I would say that um, our current discussions around theory of mind are, um, are, are broken. Um, and I will summarize it like this. Um, one of the tests of theory of mind is um, whether or not when we lie to someone, they will be able to, they will know based on the fact that we've deceived them by moving something from one space to another. So we put something in a box in front of the person and then when they're not looking, we change the box. And the question is, does this person, is this person gonna know where the item is? Um, many, many autistic brains just simply think, um, I propose, I hypothesize, uh, well, I wouldn't be dishonest. So yeah, the person's gonna find the thing or this isn't even logical, what kind of weird task is this? Let's just give the person the thing. So they give this answer of like, that's really based on kind of um, this sense of justice. 
and right or wrong, rather than um, going, well, you know, I'm going to jump through the hoops of going, no, Stacy wouldn't know it's in that box because she didn't see it was moved. So we've sort of got this broken way of measuring theory of mind at the moment that's based on sort of very capitalist and neuro majority ideas. And so there's a lot of work going into figuring out um, better ways of measuring it and, and ways of measuring it that honor autistic brains who can be extremely high empathy, high, um, extremely high uh, sense of other, sense of the person, sense of their emotion and so on. I think that's all we've got time for today. Well, no, wait, we've got four more minutes. Um, but that might be, those might be the main questions I needed to answer. Now, I do want to tell you about um, our, this is if you want to contact me. Um, the, uh, we are on Facebook, Star is on Facebook, Star is on Twitter, Star is on Instagram, um, we are not on TikTok. Uh, I am on Facebook if you want to find me on Facebook um, for sensory integration information. I'm also on Twitter if you want to hear me being angry about social justice issues. Um, there is no certificate of attendance for these free events. Um, there's a very high cost to providing those and we wanted to make these events accessible. Um, but I do hope you've enjoyed them. Um, we are doing more of these. We really want to sort of share this information. I know I went very fast. Um, you know, it, you will get the recording, you will get the PowerPoint handout. Um, we would love to see you this year. We are our... Um, our annual symposium on sensory integration and processing and sensory health is in person um, here in Colorado. And we would love to see you um, uh, if you can attend. And we'll also be online uh, broadcasting and live streaming the event um, for people. And so, um, oh, I need to stop sharing my screen. And then that didn't work, did it? And then um, I will drop the link into um the chat box and i really would love to see you either live or there you go someone got it for me and or and or online thank you so much everyone for attending and, and being here so important